ordinance and policy committee will come to order. I will note this meeting is taking place under House Rule 10.01. Ms. Hirsch, please take the roll. Chair Houseman? Present. Houseman, present. Vice Chair Howard? Howard, present. Howard, present. Representative Tice? Tice, present. Tice, present. Representative Agbaje? Present. Agbaje, present. Representative Bliss? Representative Bliss. Representative Gomez. Gomez present. Gomez present. Representative Hassan. Representative Hassan. One more time because I just added her. Representative Hassan. Uh, Hassan is here. Sorry, I was having technical issues. I couldn't hear you guys, so I had That's to log all right. Hassan, Hassan present. Representative Heinrich. Heinrich present. Heinrich present. Representative Her. Present. Her present. Representative Jurgens. Jurgens present. Jurgens present. Representative Olson is excused. Representative Farr. Farr present. Farr present. And Representative Ryer. Ryer present. Ryer present and Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, the next item of business is approval of the minutes from Tuesday, February 22. Represent Howard, have you had a chance to review those minutes? Yes, I will move the minutes. Members, any corrections? Seeing none, if you'd unmute, all those in favor of adoption of the minutes say aye. 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 Opposed nay, the motion prevails and the minutes are approved. Uh, members, the first bill on the agenda is House File 3667, and as the author of the bill, I will hand over the virtual gavel to Vice Chair Howard for the duration of the bill hearing. Thank you, Representative Hausman. Uh, and the bill that we have up is uh, your bill, and so uh, Chair Hausman, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Mr. Chair. I move that House File 3667 be referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. And you have an author's amendment, the DE1. Would you like to move that amendment before presenting your bill? Um, if, if that's, you'd prefer we, we put the amendment on and then I, then I speak to the bill? Uh, yes, let's do, let's do that. Okay. Um, and the DE uh, amendment uh, primarily, it, it fills in the blank. We didn't put a dollar amount in the um, underlying bill and we have, uh, have added 330 million of federal relief funds for rental assistance uh, to get us through June. So that is the DE. All right, all those in favor of the DE1 say aye. 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 Those opposed? The DE1 is adopted. Uh, Chair Hausman, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think maybe just to set the stage for today, I'll give a little bit of the recent history. Um, when the pandemic uh, happened, um, uh, the first people who lost their jobs were those workers in um, bars and restaurants and retail. Uh, we know a, a group of employees that are probably one paycheck away from not being able to pay their bills. And uh, so we quickly knew uh, that we wanted to protect and keep people stable and safe during that time. Um, the uh, part of that was the eviction moratorium. Um, but we also knew um, we have to protect both renters and landlords. And, um, and so we very quickly moved to set up um, an emergency uh, rental assistance that eventually uh, took the form of a more formal program, Rent, rent Help MN. It had a rocky start, as you recall, because when, every time you start a new program to get money out the door, it doesn't happen overnight. And there was no human infrastructure in place. Um, and so it took uh, some time before that happened. At the beginning, their goal had been a million dollars a day out the door. That didn't happen at the start. By the end, they were, they were getting much more than a million dollars a day out the door. So it was transformed over time and, um, and had some um, stability to it, but um, they ran out of money. When they saw that approaching, uh, they cut off the applications. There was a huge uh, outcry from uh, people across the state because we weren't through the pandemic yet and people were still in trouble. And so we immediately uh, began to say, how do, we, how do we look for emergency assistance to just get us through June um, when the off-ramp protection, off protection is still in place until then? 
So uh, that's the point of today's um, bill, 330 million of federal relief funds for uh, rental assistance to get us through um, June. Um, you know, I, we had a, a long hearing just on Rent Help MN. You saw lots of statistics at, at the time. Uh, but one of the, um, the summary comments that I made, we want, wanted during this time to keep renters secure and to keep landlords secure because we wanted that housing to continue to be safe and stable. And the good news is $537 million did find its way into uh, the hands of landlords so that they were able to continue to provide uh, good uh, housing for uh, renters. So this is uh, an emergency bill to get us um, uh, to the end of the off-ramp. And uh, we have some testifiers. Thank you, Representative Hausman. Our first testifier is Eric Haugi with Homeline. Please introduce yourself to the committee. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Howard and, and Chair Hausman and members of the committee. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 3667. My name is Eric Haugi. I'm the Executive Director of Homeline, a statewide tenant advocacy organization. Our main program is a free and confidential legal hotline for renters that has advised over 277,000 households since opening 30 years ago. Each month, in particular, since the pandemic began, we've been taking around 1,500 calls per month. In January 2022 alone, we had over a 50% increase in clients as compared to January 2021. And here in February, we have seen a similarly increased pace in the need from renter communities throughout the state. Many of these inquiries are about financial assistance, evictions, or extrajudicial displacement that is occurring at an increasing rate since Rent Help MN's application deadline last month. We wanted to just briefly share a couple of stories directly from clients that our staff spoke to very recently, who gave us permission to share their experiences to help provide some context for the extreme urgency to pass this bill as soon as possible to further uh, provide rent relief and protection against eviction for non-payment of rent during a time where many of our neighbors are still fake, facing uh, economic uncertainty and trauma. Uh, so just a couple stories. The first one is from Dorothy in Big Lake. Uh, I'm in quoting directly her words here. So um, rental assistance would help me catch up with my bills and have a place to shelter from COVID-19 and help me stay in good health. Once I have something that can help me pay my rent, then psychologically I will feel settled. When I caught COVID, it was very serious, and I've had long COVID symptoms for the past four months. I took leave from my job to take care of myself, but I've had no income. Once the doctor says it's okay to go back, I'll be able to tolerate work. At that time, my income would stabilize. I am just looking for temporary help. Rental assistance is important to people who are not able to support themselves. I have four children who depend on stable housing. Rent Help Amen is closed now and I don't know what to do. I'm trying to find other rental assistance programs but haven't had any success. If I can get help with my rent, my family and I, um, if I cannot get help, my family and I will be homeless. And then lastly, uh, Ashley from St. Cloud. I used to have a full-time job that I loved but when COVID-19 hit, they laid me off. I was able to access unemployment, but it wasn't as much as I was making before, so I had trouble keeping up with my bills. Access to Rent Help MN assistance helped me keep my housing, which I was so scared to lose. If I had to move, I'd probably have gone back to my mom's house, but that isn't a safe environment for me due to having P PTSD and depression. Um, I may lose my support animal also if I have to move. I would not know what to do in that situation. I lived in my home for four or five years, which is the longest I've had stable housing any time in my life. It's been important for me to have stable housing. Um, I've been able to only find part-time work during the pandemic. Um, and my old job was a few blocks away, but the new job has a commute, so I had to get a car. Um, I've been applying to everything I find, but there are a lot of jobs I can't get. And my landlord just raised the rent, and so I don't have a plan for the spring. I'd like to stay, but I'm very nervous and scared about what will happen if I can't make rent. So these are just a couple examples that we're hearing about on our tenant hotline on a daily basis. Um, I just wanna relay the urgency is, is pretty clear and the need is, is still there throughout the state. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. 
Thank you, Mr. Hauge. Next, we have Annie Shapiro from Minnesota Community Action Partnership uh, and a Homes for All Policy Co-Chair. Ms. Shapiro. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair and members. For the record, my name is Annie Shapiro and I'm the Advocacy Director at the Minnesota Community Action Partnership and one of the three policy co-chairs for Homes for All. I am testifying today on behalf of Homes for All in support of HF 3667 as amended. Over the past two years, Homes for All has cons consistently advocated for emergency rental assistance during the pandemic, starting in March of 2020 through the COVID Housing Assistance Program, or CHAP, through the rollout, implementation, and ultimate closure of Rent Help MN. Even as we hopefully move into a more endemic stage of the pandemic, low-income Minnesotans are recovering disproportionately slower economically than middle and upper-income Minnesotans. The need for emergency rental assistance is great. Through our Community Action Agency network, many of whom were CHAP implementers or and or Rent Help MN field partners, we have heard from around the state that the need for emergency rental assistance has been 10 times greater than current program funding. For instance, Rent Help MN applications in Clay County totaled about $5.7 million of assistance requested, while the current annual homeless prevention grant provides just $350,000 of assistance. We need to immediately pass additional funding in emergency rental assistance and also invest more in our housing programs long-term. We can and must prevent our current crisis and simultaneously work to create a better housing system in the future. I urge you to support HF 3667 as amended to ensure that our state lives up to the commitment to keep people safely and stably housed throughout the pandemic. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Next, we have Sedia Omar from New American Development Center. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for um, letting me to just uh, fight in the support of HF 3667. Um, my name is Sadia Omar. I work with NADC. I have been working with NADC since April of 2020. Um, this pandemic did um, bring a lot of emotions uh, mentally and also like financially hardship to a lot of people. Um, we do see people still coming through um, into our offices. Um, thinking that we still have like money um because we are a different agent than um the state um because a lot of uh, um families are referring to us they say you know if they stay out of you know if rent help doesn't have money i got help from uh nadc thinking that we have extra money or we have a different um funding than the state um we uh, one of um, our cons came yesterday and she has a, a kid who's autistic um, she ended up having a part-time job because uh, they stopped um, transportation uh, in uh, his school and she has to take him uh, to school and from school. Also, we had um, somebody call me uh, from, or she, she reached me through an email saying um, from St. Cloud, um, she is having difficulty like, mentally um, going through some stuff and she cannot go to work because of it. She doesn't have the support of a family members that can support her and she's scared to lose her home. Um, we still having people coming into our office um, and we don't know what to tell them. It's really um, scares them um, to see uh, people who are like mentally going through stuff or cannot have a full-time job because they have to take care of a family member who is in need of their help. Um, and, you know, it's just scary to see them, you know, to be in, in, in affection, in affection, and then losing them, them losing their housing. Um, I urge the house community um, to uh, take this seriously. Um, this is people's lives. And, you know, uh, it is really going to be a crisis if we ended up having a lot of um, Minnesotans in, a, in the streets with their children. And that to prevent that, I would urge the house community um, to take this bill seriously and, you know, um, in a faster way uh, to pass something in a faster way so we can give people hope. Um, even, you know, if we're still working on something, you know, we can still give people hope and tell them, you know, we still work on this. This needs to be passed. And, you know, um, at least to uh, have uh, um, like a press conference or something to say the how you know the renters and the, the landlords not to affect the people, but we can do it and we do have the fendings and I urge everybody to take this seriously and uh, um, aid the Minnesotans that are in need. Thank you and thank you for giving me this opportunity. 
Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Shana Tomenis from Housing Justice Center. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Shana Tomenis. I'm the Equal Justice Works Fellow at the Housing Justice Center. Um, I, the Housing Justice Center is a nonprofit public interest and legal organization whose primary mission is to preserve and protect affordable housing across the state of Minnesota. Um, I was a field partner with Rent Help MN when it was open and helped an applicant in outstate Minnesota submit their application in the last 10 minutes that the program was open. I'm here to talk about the need for House File 3667 and how we are still getting calls daily for people who are behind on rent and who are panicked. Um, you know, in the month of January, when starting um, when this program ended through now, the calls that I get are much more panicked. These are people who um, every time that an elementary school is closed means a parent or a family member or caretaker is choosing not to go to work. And often one day is the difference between being able to make rent and pay utilities or not being able to pay rent and make utilities. Um, this burden is borne by communities that have not recovered from COVID and is um, particularly borne by BIPOC communities across our state. I would say that one thing that stuck with me is I had a caller on Monday who told when she was calling from Rochester and I urged her to look into her local resources for emergency rental assistance. She told me, she asked me if it was a joke. She said, is this a joke? I have a better chance of winning the lottery than getting a local assistance. I just urged the quick passage of House File 3667 for our Minnesotans who still need this support. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. And, and last on our list is Owen Duckworth. Mr. Duckworth. Thank you, Vice Chair Howard and Chair Houseman and members of the committee for your time. Uh, my name is Owen Duckworth. I'm the Director of Organizing and Policy at the Alliance for Metropolitan Stability. Um, the Alliance is a coalition organization with over 30 member organizations that work on racial justice in our housing system, amongst other um, systems. Um, we also staff the Equity in Place Coalition, which has worked a number of years on housing justice issues in our region and our state, um, and testifying uh, on behalf of the Alliance and also in, on behalf of Equity in Place and support for um, House File 3667. Um, we see that this is really a vital, urgent need to provide significant contribution of state resources to immediately support renters in the state of Minnesota with emergency rental assistance. Um, as a coalition organization, we're hearing from many of our community partner organizations, other housing advocacy organizations, some of which you're hearing on this call, um, and housing providers as well, uh, of the desire of the dire and urgent need for rental assistance um, that many renters in our communities are, are facing. Uh, the closing of Rent Help and Men has left many people through no fault of their own without the resources to pay rent uh, and without the protections promised to them by the state as a result of last year's evict eviction moratorium off ramp policy. Um, this is all happening, of course, while as we still are living in a global pandemic with continuing negative economic impacts uh, and with many of those other support mechanisms the government has provided over the last two years now finished or, or rapidly going away. Um, since the start of the pandemic, we've seen government on many levels uh, step up in significant ways to stabilize our housing system and protect renters and homeowners and landlords alike uh, with policies of investments that has saved people's homes, saved people's livelihood, uh, livelihoods, um, and ultimately people's lives under, again, under a deadly global pandemic. Um, so the impact of this pandemic and this ensuing housing crisis, which um, honestly the housing crisis did exist in many of our communities prior to the pandemic as well and has only gotten worse, um, but it continues to be disproportionately um, felt by black, indigenous and people of color in our state. So we urge uh, and we need the members of this committee, our state legislature more broadly and Governor Walls to move on this issue with great urgency uh, in supporting House File 3667 is a massively important first step. So um, again, thank you all for your time and consideration on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Duckworth, and, and thank you to all the testifiers, not just for your testimony today, but for your work uh, during this pandemic to connect Minnesotans to this lifeline, to this rental assistance. I think um, just about every testifier uh, has been on the ground doing this work every day for months and months and months, and so thank you for your work. Uh, members, are there any uh, questions for either our testifiers or for the bill author? I guess while folks consider if they want to ask a question, I will ask one. Um, and this is really to, to any of our testifiers. 
Um, and you sort of hit on some of this during your testimony, but I'm curious, it's, it's abundantly clear how necessary rent help MN was to, to save lives and to, to keep people afloat during this pandemic. I'm curious um, in the time since rent help MN uh, closed, if, if folks have noticed a shift, um, if already you're sort of starting to see a, a noticeable shift in terms of volume of calls, um, what are sort of you're hearing on the ground from renters that are looking for assistance? And so I guess that's it's a question open to any of our testifiers that have been um, communicating with renters to answer. And maybe I'll ask Mr. Haugi. I'll, I'll put Mr. Haugi on the spot. Uh, thanks for Chair Howard and committee members. Um, yeah, we have seen, as, as I mentioned in the testimony, um, the, de the, the application deadline was towards the end of, of January. We had already seen a significant uptick in January. Uh, again, comparing it to the previous January, our call volume is 50% higher than last January. Um, and the stories of the renters that I shared are all within this month in February. Um, folks that are calling us asking about, uh, you know, financial assistance, um, some of the top uh, categories of, of issues that are inquiries that people are contacting us about are again, financial assistance, which is not normally something that we had, we advise on. Uh, it's not necessarily a legal issue, um, but we've gotten a lot of calls about financial, the need for financial assistance. And then um, people who are facing eviction uh, who might have a pending application or might not have been able to get one in in time. Um, and then other forms of extrajudicial displacement, uh, lease terminations, lease non-renewals, those types of things. And I see Ms. Uh, Tumenis has her hand raised too. Ms. Ms. Tumenis. Uh, thank you. Yes, I would say that our organization has seen um, not a, an increase is a different matter. What we have seen is an increase in callers who have not been able to successfully receive emergency rental assistance that we are unable to serve, that we have not been able to find another organization to refer them to. And the level of panic and fear of displacement is the highest that I have seen in the two years I have been working at the Housing Justice Center. Th thank you. That's helpful, I think, to the committee and underscores um, the importance of this bill. Uh, I see Representative Farr's hand. Representative Farr. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Chair Hausman, for the bill. Um, a couple of questions. So as I understand it, since the program ended, there's been about $500 million in request. Uh, and, and yet we're talking about 330 million here. Um, so is this a band-aid? Are we gonna be coming back later to to do more? Or is this enough? I guess maybe is the is the first question. And then if, if those numbers are correct, two-part question, um, are we gonna take those chronologically or is there some process which, which ones get served and which ones don't? If there's 500 million in request, we're allocating 330 million. Um, Representative Hausman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Farr. Um, our the, the this is the the 330 is the work of advocates and others who have looked at uh, just the the backlog of applications and so forth. So it there was some work done behind this. So I haven't heard that other number, um, the, the 500. Uh, I, I that's that's not a number that that uh, I have heard from anyone. So our uh, best assumption based on both working with the department, with the agency, and advocates is that 330 million is the need to get us through June. Now that doesn't mean that the problem ends at June. Um, we know, for example, that um, the federal government knew a long time ago that, that rental assistance for some people is essential, and so the, the Section 8 uh, voucher was a longstanding um, uh, service from the federal government. But we know it was almost a false promise because people would get on the waiting list for Section 8 and they would be on that waiting list for, for um, years. Uh, that's why Representative Howard uh, is bringing a bill forward this year uh, that uh, Beacon and others have worked on for some time uh, that, that tries to say um, if this need isn't being taken care of with the Section 8 vouchers at the federal level anymore, we have to look at some other 
uh, accommodation at the state level. So we have more work to do, but this is this is our short short term emergency fix. And, and Representative Hausman, Representative Farr, I believe that 500 million figure you're referring to might be coming from the presentation from Minnesota Housing and represents their total request. And so that would include what's already been paid, as I understand. Um, and so I think that what, as we heard from Minnesota Housing, what drove their decision to um, need to close down is just the, the requests were gonna surpass the, the resources, but that with this 300 million, we could, we could get through June. Uh, do, you, do you have a follow-up, Representative? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, and and, uh, and I appreciate that, uh, Chair Howard. I, that, that's part of part of my question that I think helps answer it. So, uh, last one. Then I, you know, I, I was a little concerned with how quickly this ended. We we spent. It looks like about ten percent of the money we had to administer this, and that was the guidelines that were, were put in place for rent help when it started. Um, so, are we to expect? That ten percent of this three hundred thirty million will be used to administer these dollars again. Uh, Re 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 Representative Hausman, Mr. Chair, and uh, Representative Farr. Yes, the, and in fact, I think we have language. Um, I don't have the bill language in front of me. I think the the bill language actually even uh -huh. says that that we are accommodating uh, an administration, an assumption of administration. Re Representative Farr, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Tice. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for bringing this forward as well. Uh, a couple concerns I have is, Rob, is the governor able to fund this by just through general funds? And I guess my other question is, on something like this that I think is important, uh, we're not seeing any Senate support. Uh, is there a possibility we might see something on the Senate side yet? Well, uh, I, I think, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Representative Hausman. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, uh, it's my understanding, I mean, at a certain point, this is moving so quickly, um, we know that um, leaders have conversation at this particular point. Now, this is designating federal relief funds for rental assistance. So, uh, and, and that too is, is, is specified. Um, at that point, I'm assuming there, there will uh, have to be some uh, leadership discussion as well. Representative Tice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm also a little bit um, concerned that we aren't looking at other pathways to going forward. This weekend, actually at Costco, I had a conversation with uh, Tammy Berry who works with Career Solutions and she's not seen the funding she used to see. So her office is not open as much, which helps folks um, maybe get the training they need, find the resources to get back in jobs, uh, do that type of thing. Um, while I think this is important, I'm also concerned that we're not, um, <coughs> excuse me, that we're not um, doing something a little bit more proactive. And I'm hoping at some point we can do that uh, I know of talking to Ms. Berry that it is very concerning to her that they haven't seen more dollars to be open like they used to be uh, to the point where people are afraid that uh, she's afraid people are thinking they're not available anymore. And I think that's a, a big part about getting people back on their feet again. She's had some wonderful ideas that we've been talking about and I've been sharing some of the ideas that I have and we're kind of on the same page that, you know, in order to uh, redefine maybe how some people were, were working and where their money was coming from. Uh, how does that work? And, and I'm hoping we can be more proactive on that end of it. Uh, she's got, like I said, wonderful ideas. And in fact, one of the ideas she said, how about the next time we start building um, multifamily, we also look at putting daycare space in a, multi, in a, in a unit, um, which I think makes a heck of a lot of sense. And so uh, I'm really interested in looking at some of those ways to kind of get people back again to find out why why I know a lot of people were laid off they were in the hospitality business we're still lacking in that um, it's still hard to find people because of the different factors like daycare uh, why they're not working um, so I hope we also look in that as well and that we see that but I also think that if the governor has an opportunity to to put some general fund dollars in here 
I would really like to see that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Tice. Uh, do you have a comment to that, Representative Hausman? No, good, good ideas. I'm not seeing any other hands. Are there any other members that have a question or wanted to, to make a comment? If not, before going back to Representative Hausman, I just wanted to briefly comment on the bill um, and its importance and just underscore the urgency to move this forward, to pass this bill uh, early in the session. You know, at every uh, there, there's multiple pieces of legislation this year that um, various legislators have um, sort of sounded the alarm that we need to move forward quickly, but I can't think of a more important issue than this one. Um, just to underscore some of the, the data we heard from Commissioner Ho about who Rent Help MN has served. And 89% of applicants have been very low income, uh, earning less than 50% AMI. 70% are extremely low income, earning uh, less than 30% AMI. And two thirds of applicants um, who provided demographic information are black households of color or indigenous households. Uh, throughout this pandemic, uh, we have all been pulling together under the principle that people shouldn't be evicted uh, during a global pandemic. Uh, and, and we've done, I think, very well by utilizing resources, working together to make that happen. But we're still in a pandemic. And uh, from their testifiers, it's so clear that this need is urgent and it's worsening and it calls for us to take urgent action. So I really wanna thank Chair Hausman for leading and moving this bill forward and for all the folks that are pulling together on behalf of renters and landlords uh, and hope that we can move this forward quickly this session. And um, we'll turn it back to Representative Hausman to make closing comments on her bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to thank you, um, thank the committee members for their attention to this issue and a special thanks for all the testifiers uh, that got us to this point um, and, 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 and telling those stories. The stories are compelling and they motivate us uh, to work hard on this. So I, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I would renew my motion that House File 3667 as amended be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Ms. Hirsch, please take the roll. Chair Houseman? Aye. Vice Chair Howard? Aye. Representative Tice? Aye. Representative Agbaje? Aye. Representative Bliss? No. Representative Gomez? Aye. Representative Hassan? Aye. Representative Heinrich? Heinrich, no. Representative Hur? Aye. Representative Jurgens? Jurgens, aye. Representative Olson is excused. Representative Farr? Farr, no. And Representative Ryer? Aye. We have nine ayes and three nays. Thank you. Uh, with that vote, I will now hand, uh, the, the bill is, re, is passed and referred to uh, Ways and Means. And with that, I will hand it back over to Chair Hausman. Thank you, um, Representative Howard. Um, the next bill on the agenda is House File 2860. Representative Howard, we're, we've got you right back up there. <laughs> would you like to move your bill? Yes, Madam Chair, I would move House File 2860. Be uh, passed and be referred to judiciary. Okay, that um, uh, uh, Representative Howard moves that House File 2860 be re referred to the Committee on Judiciary Finance and Civil Law um, to your bill, um, Representative Howard. Thank Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this bill it, it is a good follow on to the one we just heard uh, and is born out of our experience with the renter landlord relationship during our eviction moratorium and eviction moratorium off ramp. As policymakers, I believe we want to learn from this time, this unprecedented time. And uh, if there's lessons we can learn to improve systems going forward, we should seize them. And that's what this bill is born out of. Um, one aspect of our eviction moratorium off-ramp that was actually brought forward by the Senate majority 
in their bill uh, was a provision to prevent evictions while renters had an open rental assistance claim with Rent Help MN. And the goal of such a provision uh, is to find that win-win for both renters and landlords so that uh, we have good communication and we ensure that landlords are made whole and renters uh, who have fallen behind are able to avoid uh, that black mark of an eviction and maintain their housing stability. And this policy has worked well uh, in the off-ramp. It has benefited landlords to the tune of tens and hundreds of millions of dollars, and it's helped renters maintain their housing stability. So we believe that this is a policy that has merit, not just during a pandemic, but in perpetuity. Uh, in doing so, again, we encourage the kind of communication between renters and landlords that are mutually beneficial so that our renters have fallen behind, they've lost their job, they've become sick. Uh, they can get that emergency rental assistance they need to catch up. Um, it can be paid to a landlord and uh, we create that win-win. And on the flip side, I want to call out if a renter does have an open rental assistance claim and they do end up uh, having eviction filed or becoming evicted, that's a lose-lose. The landlord does not collect the rent that is owed it has to proceed, proceed through a costly eviction process. And the renter loses their home and has the black market eviction that will follow them for years and years and years. And it's completely avoidable. And that is what this bill uh, will address. Uh, it's a common sense way to improve renter tenant law in a way that's mutually beneficial to renters and landlords. And I hope it will have your support. And with that, I would like to turn it over to my testifiers. Um, thank you, uh, Representative Howard. Um, we have some testifiers. Luke Grundman from Mid Minnesota Legal Aid. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Uh, thank you, Chair Hausman, Representative Howard, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and support House File 2860. My name is Luke Grundman. I am the litigation director for Mid Minnesota Legal Aid. Legal Aid represents hundreds of Minnesota families each year facing eviction in court. Um, over the past six months, as Representative Howard mentioned, we've been able to see a test run of this legislation. An analogous provision to the one that's uh, before the committee has been in effect. Um, and it's been a resounding success. I had the, I requested data from the 4th Judicial District, which covers Hennepin County, just this morning. And they informed me that 20% of all evictions that have been filed in that time period have been stayed because of pending rent help applications. So 20% of eviction cases, that translates to almost 2,500 Minnesota families every year who are prevented from being evicted and losing their homes. And it's a win-win situation, as Representative Howard said. It, it also results in landlords getting their money. This is a a provision that that helps both sides to the transaction. And of course, it doesn't even account for all of the cases that have not been filed due to this existing provision. Hopefully, we have seen filing rates down statewide, uh, even from pre-pandemic levels. And of course, we don't know why, but it makes sense that if landlords have pending applications, they're waiting for their money, there's no need for them to evict families or to even start that process. And it prevents that eviction filing from being on the on their record. Um, so now we're talking about a provision that prevents eviction cases from even being filed in court. And we know it's the act of filing the case that leads to so many negative results for families. And we know as landlords will tell us, they don't they don't want to evict anybody. No, no landlord is out there, very few I should say, are out there hoping to evict people. They don't want to go that way. Um, and so they only do it when they think they have no other choice. So this is a, a common sense solution that would, uh, again, provide a win-win for both sides. And I just want to tell you about one of the clients I represented in court. She's a, a, a young woman, she's 23 years old. She's living with a three-year-old child, just her and her child. She's in her first home. She's making it on her own. Um, but then last September, her hours were cut at work, and she struggled to make her rent payments. So like many Minnesotans, she applied for rent assistance. Her application was denied due to a, a glitch in the system. There was a, a phone number that matched hers that was part of a different application. And so it was denied. They thought there was a mistake and it turned out to just be a, uh, her sister using the same cell phone number that, that she used to apply. So there was a glitch. Her application was denied on that basis. An eviction case was filed. 
she came to court in a panic, wondering where she's going to live and how she's going to survive and find housing that's safe and healthy for her child when she has an eviction record. Um, but again, luckily, the case was immediately put on hold. Uh, she managed to meet with uh, both a, an, a legal aid lawyer and a representative from Rent Help to check on her application. And, and the court said this eviction should be put on hold. Let's let this application go forward. Um, and it did. The money was paid or is in the process of being paid as we speak. Everyone goes home happy. Her record is clear. She gets to continue to live her life. Uh, this one small glitch in uh, in a 23-year-old's life didn't have the long-standing negative effect that we know evictions can cause. This is a good bill, and I encourage the members of the committee to vote for it. And thank you, Representative Howard, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Grumman. We're also joined by Eric Haugi from Homeline. Welcome back. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Houseman, and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 2860. Uh, and Vice Chair Howard, thank you for introducing a bill that will provide needed assistance and stability to tenants while ensuring payment of rental assistance to landlords. Um, as has been shared repeatedly today, renters are continuing to experience uncertainty and instability. Rent was already increasing beyond many low-income households' means. Um, and since the pandemic, jobs have been lost. Parents have had, had, had to stay home with their children. Uh, and people have become ill. And so what should the state's objective be during these difficult times? Uh, to resolve crises and to avert housing instability and, and reduce homelessness. Um, that's why the reasonable approach in this bill that's already been tested uh, over, the over the last year is, is really necessary. Um, there, you've already gone into details about, um, about how it works, but ultimately what this will do is hopefully resolve a lot of these issues outside of court. As Luke mentioned, sometimes they'll be in court, but we've definitely talked to many folks over the past year um, who avoided uh, an eviction action getting filed against them because they were able to discuss with their landlord about a pending application. Um, it's gonna greatly increase the number of landlords who get paid um, and, and keep tenants in their homes uh, and hopefully minimize the chance of that eviction being on their record. Um, yeah, we estimate that over the past, you know, since since July of last year, when the phase out law went into effect, we've we've advised hundreds of renter households throughout the state about how a pending application uh, can protect them. Uh, so we can tell the policy has already kept hundreds, if not thousands of folks in their homes uh, while landlords were, were adequately paid. Just one recommendation we want to share um, is how much of a benefit of pairing this policy within this bill with a pre eviction notice requirement similar to what was also in last year's eviction moratorium phase out law. Uh, that was of course a temporary policy that just went through June of last, or sorry, uh, mid-October of last year. Um, but you'd be surprised that, you know, ensuring tenants are aware how much is owed and that there are rental assistance programs available is just a common sense yet surprisingly useful practice. Um, how, are you surprised at how many people we spoke to over the past year uh, who are simply not aware of the availability of rental assistance um, while rent help then was was in effect. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to testify and uh, please support this bill. Thank you, Mr. Haugi. And our final testifier is Kyle Burnt from the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Kyle Burnt. I am the Director of Public Policy at the Minnesota Multi-Housing Association, uh, known as MHA. MHA is an industry nonprofit representing 1,800 members and 300,000 uh, rental housing units in the state. I'm here today to respectfully raise our opposition to House File 2860. The proposal in front of the committee today would not allow for an eviction action for non-payment of rent to move forward if an application for any federal, state, local, or nonprofit uh, rental assistance program is pending. Um, however, this language is too broad of a definition of rental assistance and would include rental assistance programs that are not intended to be a timely resource for an emergency non-payment rental occurrence. We believe additional language identifying the resources for emergency non-payment would improve the proposal. Not all housing assistance programs function well. We are concerned that having no timeliness requirement for applications could be used in an attempt to delay eviction action 
when, an, when a resident may knowingly or unknowingly be ineligible for uh, emergency rental assistance. Even if the author is able to remedy some of these issues that we highlighted on the timeliness and the definition, MHA would continue to uh, oppose this proposal. Uh, the reason for this is that some local jurisdictions have adopted several different timelines of a, for a notice period prior to filing an eviction. These ordinances add a layer of complexity as they reflect a patchwork of policies in the state. As an example, uh, the city of Minneapolis has a 14-day notice requirement that must be provided prior to filing an eviction action for uh, non-payment of rent. This standard would provide uh, someone until the 13th day to make a rental assistance application for, e for emergency assistance EA through, the, through Hennepin County. At that point, Hennepin County would process the application. Applications through this process have been known to take 30 days or more. At the end of, this, at the, end of the duration, the application could be rejected and housing providers could be on the hook for unpaid rent uh, for more than 45 days. With other cities considering longer requirements, the impact of this policy could be devastating, especially for smaller operators with few units to offset these costs. And finally, housing providers in Minnesota know the best business practice is to avoid evictions and keep tenants stably in their homes. Rental owners and operators regularly work with local and county programs for emergency assistance for residents and understand the value of these programs uh, and what they can provide for both the residents and the operators. Uh, let's not forget Minnesota has a strong deterrent to evictions through the state's $300 filing fee on top of other fees that are, and a requirement that in most courts, housing providers must hire attorneys to represent them uh, uh, in, in trial. So with that, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, Madam Chair members. Thank you, Mr. Burnt. Um, members, do we have questions for the testifiers or for the bill's author? Representative Tice? Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I'm having issues with my video. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and for Representative Howard. I do appreciate the bill being brought forward, but I think we, we have just a little bit of work. Um, some of the questions I'm going to ask, and maybe they're in the bill, but I'm not uh, necessarily finding them, is do the same exceptions for eviction hold true? Like if there's been an egregious act or something like that? Representative Howard. Thank you, Representative Tice. I'm pulling the bill up right now. Um, I'm not sure if we have those in. That, that's something I'd definitely be open to, to looking at as we proceed. Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm seeing uh, Mr. Grundman just popped his head in, and I'm not sure if he knows the answer to that one. M Mr. Grundman, did you want to, um, did, did you have an answer to that? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Chair Hausman, Representative Howard, and Representative Tice. Um, yes, it, it would have the same exceptions because the prohibition on on filing evictions is limited to cases that are purely about non-payment of rent. So the the cases you're thinking of involving criminal activity, breach of lease, or really any other you know type of eviction besides non-payment of rent would still be allowed to go forward regardless of this legislation. Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Also, is there a timeline on how long a housing provider has to wait to get payment? Um, that's one thing I've been hearing a little bit about is it's taking so long. And also, you know, the housing provider will fill out the application and wait for the renter to sign. That was another issue that we saw and the renter isn't doing that. Is there, is there something that'll change that so that if a housing provider actually shows a lot of documentation and can prove that the renter is not signing on to it, that they can still get a payment? Representative Howard. Uh, thank you, Representative Tice. To the timing piece, and this is something that when I met um, with Minnesota Multi-Housing, we discussed and have had some dialogue about. I do think that there is something to be said about creating some sort of uh, timing parameter so that there's at least some sense of how long this process would take. Although what I would say um, is, the length and eviction stays on a renter's record is, um, I, I believe, seven years. And when we're, so the, the type of timeline we're talking, especially when landlords are eventually going to likely get a paycheck, um, you know, th that is sort of the balance that I think is important to be part of the conversation. But I do think I hear the feedback about wanting to have 
some kind of sense of when resources would be coming. Um, and so I, I'm open to that conversation going forward. Representative Tice. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Howard. I think that's really important because uh, at some point, a lot of these housing providers aren't going to be able to pay their bills. And so what you're going to see is we're going to possibly look at folks that are just going to say, I'm just not going to, I can't do this anymore. I can't throw more money after more money and expect to not get anything for it. So I think that's a big piece of it. Um, you know, I, I, I think we still have a little bit of work to do on this, and I would like to see some of the things that we talked about reflected in that, and I'm certainly open to talk about it, but I'm not really sure how I'm going to go on this one. I just think that I, I understand it, but I also understand that there's a lot of folks out there wondering what they're going to do, and I will tell you the housing market is not helping. Uh, the house across our street sold in hours. And realtors are looking everywhere for houses. And I think at some point, I'm really afraid we're gonna lose a lot of our houses if we don't make sure that we get them straight so that they can pay their bills. And that part of it just really, uh, that's really hard. We've been very fortunate. I will tell you with our five rentals, we've been working with our five folks. Uh, they've, been doing, they've been doing well, we've been patient. We will take half and half payments, whatever works for them. Uh, but it's it's been really frustrating to see what's been happening to other housing providers as well. So at some point, I think we just need to look at some of these changes. And uh, I have to say, I'm a little disappointed. Uh, Representative Abadje's uh, bill on mediation is not coming forward because I think that is such an important part of what we're talking about as well. So I hope we see that soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Tice. So, uh, Representative Howard, any um, should I, should we just want a, some of the other quick testifiers or did you want to? Just a quick comment to say that Representative Tice, I would love to work together on this bill. And if you have very specific feedback, I'd love to chat offline about it. I would say to the one point to the comment about, you know, the economic impact to landlords, you know, if we didn't have this pre uh, provision in our eviction moratorium off ramp, I think the impact would have been landlords would have been out several million dollars more um, and done the right way. I think something like this can be mutually beneficial. And if there's ways to kind of tweak and work on it, I look forward to doing so. Representative Abadje, uh, question? Yeah, um, question and a comment, I guess. Um, so I'm really glad, Representative Howard, that you're bringing this forward. Um, I think, as we've discussed, it really starts to stabilize the assistance programs. Um, particularly for renters and landlords, so they can start to know um, when they can get those payments, um, which as we've heard today, is just goes a long way for uh, peace of mind for so many people. Um, but I think it also brings up the important conversation that people have been talking about with um, the timeline and underscores the needs that we have in making sure that we're updating those timelines, um, particularly when it comes to notice. Um, I know one of the testifiers talked about notice and how notice is different across the state, and so I think it would behoove all of us to uh, look at a standardized statewide notice process so that way we know what the timelines are both for tenants to be able to plan and landlords to be able to plan. So uh, just want to say thank you again Representative Howard for bringing this forward. Representative Egbaje, you have an amendment to this bill. Would you like to offer the A1 amendment? Yes, Madam Chair, I would like to offer the A1 amendment. Um, I'd also like to move for an oral amendment to fix a typographical error um, on page one, line three of the A1 amendment, um, which would just delete uh, 317 and insert 317A. And then that would put the amendment in proper order. Um, okay. So I pre appreciate member support on the oral amendment as well. So Representative Agbaje moves the A1 um, as um, with the oral amendment fixing a typo. Uh, members, any discussion to the A1 as amended? I see uh, nothing. I, oh, Re Representative Howard, did you? I'll just say, Representative Hausman, Representative Igbaje, I appreciate the amendment. I think it's a, a good one and helps um, it give a fuller definition, a more specific definition of what we're talking about when, when, when it comes to rental assistance. And so I'd support it. Okay, thank you. Um, I see no questions. So uh, if you would unmute members, um, all those in favor of the A1 as amended say aye. 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 
Opposed, nay. The motion prevails and the A1 is adopted. Um, and uh, we have no more testifiers and looks like no more questions. Uh, Representative Howard, um, final comments on, on the bill. Uh, Chair Hausman and members, I appreciate the discussion. Uh, I think this is a very uh, important bill that we can move forward, learn lessons from the eviction moratorium off ramp and look forward to working uh, together on a bipartisan basis to, to improve the bill as it moves forward in the process. Thank you. And would you like to renew your motion? Yes, I would renew my motion uh, to, uh, where is my spot here? Renew this motion uh, to pass as amended and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Civil Law. Uh, that is uh, Representative Howard's motion. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Houseman? Aye. Vice Chair Howard? Howard, aye. Representative Tice? No. Representative Egbadge? Aye. Representative Bliss? No. Representative Gomez? Gomez, I. Representative Hassan. Hassan, I. Representative Heinrich. Heinrich, no. Representative Her. I. Representative Jurgens. Jurgens, no. Representative Olson is excused. Representative Farr. Or no. And Representative Ryer. Ryer, aye. We have seven ayes and five nays. There being seven ayes and five nays, the motion prevails and the bill is passed. Thank you, Representative Howard. Uh, now, the last bill on the agenda for today is House File 3098. Representative Agbaje, would you like to move your bill? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to uh, move my bill for, sorry, just one second. <laughs> yes, I'd like to move that House File 3098 be referred to the Committee on Judiciary on Finance and Civil Law. Thank you. And um, to your speaking to your bill? Uh, yes, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, also members of the committee. Uh, so today I'm here to present House File 3098 uh, that will allow tenants to bring forward habitability defenses when faced with an eviction without having to first pay the back rent that is actually at issue in a case like this. So the current practice in Minnesota amounts to a violation of due process by requiring tenants to pay the disputed rent amount into court before the judge will even hear the substandard living condition defenses to an eviction. Landlord-tenant law codifies that the landlord and tenant enter into a covenant of habitability when they sign a lease. And so this means that as much as a tenant must pay their rent, landlords also have the responsibility to provide premises that are fit for the intended use and that they're also in a reasonable state of repair. Unfortunately, we know that there are certain landlords that do not maintain this covenant. Recently in the media, we have heard of landlords that do not provide heat, do not address infestations of mice or other pests, and do not fix plumbing issues. And one can imagine that it's hard to justify paying the rent until such repairs like that are made. Yet, if you don't pay your rent, the next step can be an eviction. And in Minnesota, when tenants are faced with a landlord who does not keep their end of the covenant and then tries to evict, the tenant does have the right to bring up the living conditions um, in, their, in their home as a defense. And those are what's known in the legal community as Fritz defenses. But even with the ability to bring a Fritz defense, courts in Minnesota have created this arbitrary rule that a tenant must pay the disputed amount of rent to the court before it'll even hear that defense. And if the tenant does not pay, then the case is disposed in favor of the landlord and no issues about the living conditions are heard or decided upon. So practically, this means that some of our lowest income community members who are living in substandard housing cannot even afford defend themselves in court against the landlord's allegations. So this bill would put a stop to this practice to allow, because what's happening is justice is now out of reach for some of our most vulnerable neighbors. 
So this bill does not prevent a tenant from pursuing um, an affirmative action against the landlord and putting their rent in escrow with the court. And it also does not change the requirement for a tenant to post rent if a tenant wants to appeal an adverse ruling. This bill's only purpose is really to ensure access to the courts for tenants who have significant defenses to an eviction from a landlord who does not provide a habitable living conditions as required by the lease. Um, and I know I have some testifiers with me today, so I'll turn it over to them who can speak more to the practical benefits of the bill. Thank you, Representative Igbaje. Yes, we have several testifiers. First is Mary Kajorek from Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Mary Kachorik, and I'm an attorney in the housing unit at Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. I'm testifying from my experience representing hundreds of renters in Hennepin County. As Representative Igbaje has described, in Minnesota, a lease is a two-way street. The landlord agrees to provide a healthy and safe home, and the tenant agrees to pay the rent. If a tenant breaks their end of the bargain, they can get evicted. But if a landlord breaks their end of the bargain, the tenant might not owe all that rent. It's up to the court to decide how much the tenant owes when there are repair problems. The court looks at the rent amount, what the problems were, how long they lasted, how severe the problems were, and then makes a decision about whether and how much rent money that tenant owes. But to have that day in court, the tenant has to pay. If a landlord files an eviction case, the tenant has to front all of the rent, no matter how bad the conditions are. And no other type of civil case requires a person to pay to assert a defense. Many of the renters that I have helped in my practice cannot have that day in court because their rent money has already been spent to fix the issues on their own. I'll talk now about a family I helped. Um, this was a family with little kids living in an older home in South Minneapolis. This home had a lot of problems. There were mice and roaches, a broken oven and a broken stove, insulation problems, gaps around the windows and the front door. The attic window had a gap of about four inches that just let cold air in because the window couldn't close. There were exposed wiring, um, plumbing problems, and eventually it got cold enough that the pipes froze and the basement flooded. The landlord had been, notice on, for, had been on notice for all of these issues, but hadn't fixed anything. So this family was unable to cook because they didn't have a functioning kitchen. So they had to get fast food or restaurant food to feed the kids. This family needed heat, but the landlord wouldn't fix the heat. So they had to buy space heaters to heat their home so that their family could be there. This family needed a functioning toilet, so they had to hire their own plumber to get a working toilet. And this family had to clean up backed up sewage and had to hire cleaners to clean up that backed up sewage. So this is just one example, but I have seen homes with rat infestations. I've seen homes with mold so bad that there are mushrooms blooming out of the wall. I've seen exposed wiring, gas leaks, you name it, there has been a renter in Minnesota with that problem. Minnesota renters should not have to pay to bring these issues up with a judge. This bill will remove this barrier and improve access to justice for Minnesota renters who just want their day in court. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for this opportunity to testify. Thank, thank you, Ms. Kozorek. And we have next up, I believe is Ron Elwood. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair, members, Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. And I don't have much to add to what my colleague at Legal Aid, Mary, has just said. All, all I want to do is just to actually say that um, we have appreciated the opportunity to chat with the Minnesota Multi Housing Association, MHA. Um, I don't think they necessarily agree with the bill. But we do want to just acknowledge that we have the opportunity to chat with them and we do appreciate their input and always would be willing to work with them and work for, you know, on going forward if there's something we can work out. So I just wanted to add that to the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elwood. And uh, finally, we have uh, Chris Kala, attorney with Hungary and Turner. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Christopher Kala. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Hanbury and Turner. We represent landlords, both property owners and property managers in state and federal court from the trial process all the way through the appeals. We litigate fair housing, rent escrow cases, and evictions. I'm intimately familiar with the process that this bill 
seeks to address. Uh, the Fritz case from uh, 1973 is a Minnesota Supreme Court case that essentially established the process whereby rent that is not disputedly owed gets deposited with the court in order for a tenant to litigate the common law habitability defense. To be clear, where rent is disputed, meaning the tenant says they paid the rent, the courts do not require a posting. The posting requirement only occurs in those situations where the landlord alleges that rent was not paid, the tenant admits that rent wasn't paid, but in the habitability situation, the tenant also alleges a defense regarding the habitability of the apartment such that the whole rent shouldn't be owed. It's only in those cases where the rent admittedly unpaid is required to be deposited with the court in order for the tenant to litigate their defense. The tenant is not required to pay anything beyond the contract rent that they admit is owing. Now, in the situation that Ms. Kachorik addresses, where the tenant has demonstrated expenses paid to address these issues prior to the eviction being filed. It's my experience that the courts routinely give the tenant the benefit of those expenses and deduct that from the amount of rent that would typically be off required to be paid into the court. In cases where the landlord has evict, is, is alleging both breach and non-payment of rent, we call those combo cases under 504B 285 subdivision five, those evictions are bifurcated alleging the breach case first and then the non-payment. In those situations, even when the tenant alleges habitability and admits they haven't paid the rent, there's no posting requirement there. The Fritz v. Worthing case in 1973 outlined the procedure for whereby the rent has to be deposited for the back rent that's admittedly unpaid and the rent going forward. I'm concerned that the court I'm, I'm sorry, I'm concerned this committee views that this is a due process violation because the constitutionality of the Fritz v. Wharton process is for the purview of the courts. If in fact, there are concerns that the process in Fritz v. Wharton is unconstitutional, the proper remedy for that is for the Court of Appeals. Certainly, this committee has the ability to modify the statutes with regards to certain procedures that the court, that this committee finds objectionable that are still constitutional. But if it's a constitutional issue, I would urge the committee yield to the Supreme Court for that. The other issue that Ms. Kachorik's client could have done was simply file a rent escrow action. And in that rent escrow action, they would be required to post with the court the amount of rent that's unpaid. And again, they would be allowed the opportunity to tell the court, look, we're not gonna pay the full thousand dollars into the court because we've already spent $500 making the repairs or we spent the entire rent making the repairs. In those situations, the first appearance on the rent escrow case, those facts are addressed and an appropriate posting requirement is decided. And often when the tenant can demonstrate they've paid money to address repairs that the landlord hasn't, the tenant is not required to post that amount of repair money into the court. One issue we have, Your Honor, is, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, <laughs> is the uh, Ellis v. Doe case from uh, 2019. It's a Minnesota Supreme Court case. And it says that compared to a rent escrow case, when a tenant alleges that in defense of an eviction that there's habitability issues, the tenant is not required to give the landlord any advance notice of any repair issues. Whereas in a rent escrow case under the Minnesota statutes, 14 days prior to filing their action, the tenant has to tell the landlord, here are a list of repairs that need to be addressed. When those repairs aren't made, 14 days later, the tenant can file the rent escrow case. Under Ellis v. Doe, the Minnesota Supreme Court says, those rent escrow procedures are not required when a landlord brings an eviction and a tenant wants to raise habitability as an affirmative defense, as opposed to an affirmative action in a rent escrow case. And the problem I foresee is that tenants are no longer going to bring rent escrow cases because in rent escrow cases, perhaps the statute requires them to post rent. Tenants are no longer going to give landlords 14 days notice of, of habitability issues that need to be repaired. They're just going to show up at eviction court once the landlord files the eviction. And for the first time, then the landlord might learn of these habitability issues. And that's what the Supreme Court has already said. You don't need to give the landlord advance notice when you're getting evicted only when you need to bring a rent escrow action. 
The last thing I want to address briefly is Ms. Kachorik's concern that no other civil case requires the defendant to put up anything to litigate the defense. That's not actually true. There are five other areas of law in Minnesota. Pre-judgment attachment under Minnesota Statute 57002, mechanics liens under Minnesota Statute Chapter 514, quick cake, cake condemnation proceedings, Minnesota Statute 117042, bail, Minnesota Criminal Procedure Rule 602, and litigation surety bonds, Minnesota Statute 562.02. The Fritz v. Warthin procedure is constitutional and it is not a problem as it's applied currently in Minnesota eviction cases. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Kala. Um, members, do we have any questions for the testifiers or for um, uh, the, the bill's author? Representative Tice. Me again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just probably want to make a few comments and I absolutely lost where I wrote them down, but we'll try to figure it out as we go. Um, I guess the thing that bothers me the most is with housing providers, we have several, if you, if you have section uh, eight, you have several different inspections within a year. And I'm wondering where do we hold inspectors as being liable for some of the stuff? Uh, since we do have inspections. And the reason we have the inspections is to make sure the houses are safe. I know I said this before, but we were actually uh, working with HRA to make sure that one of our tenants didn't get moved to another place because the seal on the refrigerator was bad and we were in the process of waiting to get it, which we couldn't because of backlog. Um, found out the refrigerator seal was just bad and it took a long time to get one. So if they're going to hit us up for something like that, I, I, I'm just astounded that somebody doesn't raise a red flag on some of these folks, because I don't think you'll, you'll have a housing provider out there that will say that any of this is okay. None of us want to see this. It is absolutely horrendous. But at what point do we, we also point the finger at the inspectors and say, hey, this happened on your, your call. What is going on with this? Are we looking into that at all? Is is that an answer you're pose a question you're posing or a comment? Um, maybe a question. I mean, at what point do we say what do what do the uh, what part do the inspectors have on this? I mean, they're the ones that say whether or not a place is safe or not. And I guess maybe Representative Vajay, are we are we looking at why why do these houses even get how do they get a clean bill? Representative yeah. Bajay, or, or would you uh, like to ask one of your testifiers or? Whoever yeah, wants to answer it and I'm seeing, <laughs> okay. I'm seeing there is I'll, somebody else. I'm I'll, seeing take, the, I'll, I'll take a first uh, attempt, oh, Madam Chair, okay. and then I'll turn it and over to, turn to Mary. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Tice, for the question. I think that's a really great question. There, you know, this is a whole spectrum and continuum of issues along what constitutes habitable living conditions. And we do know that most landlords do what they're supposed to do and they're taking care of repairs, but this is really for those landlords who don't do that. Um, there has been discussions about other ways we can address this or, you know, ways along the continuum that we can address this. And I think your idea about getting, you know, holding inspectors accountable to hold those landlords who are not doing their job accountable is, is an appropriate discussion. Um, but what we're trying to do here is get at this one piece where tenants can't even bring that defense up because of the practice that's happening. Yes, we know what the law says on the books, but there are a number of judges um, that continue to do this practice that require uh, tenants uh, to pay uh, when, they, when they really don't have that ability to do so. And there's no other types of civil cases that allow them to pay before you can put forward a defense. I um, mean, with that, I'll also I'll turn it to Mary if she has additional comments. Ms. Kajorek. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Tice for the question. What I'd like to add is that not all municipalities require inspections and not all municipalities even require that a landlord have a rental license. And um, for those cities where a license is required, enforcement looks very, very different depending on what city you're in and how um, robust the inspections department is. Sometimes a, a city won't even have an inspections department. 
And it depends on the housing code. In Minneapolis, for example, there's no ordinance about mold. And so if a, if a home has a terrible mold problem, there isn't a remedy that an inspector in Minneapolis can, can give because it's not part of the housing code. So the, the role of the inspectors is an important one, but it's, it's not the only remedy that renters have for good reason, because it varies so much jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And I, I will just add that um, the, the posting requirements is such a barrier because in eviction cases, the housing, or the, the stakes are so high in eviction cases. Homelessness is what happens if you lose an eviction case. And this is a deprivation of a property, right? And there needs to be due process. There are thousands of more eviction cases than there are in escrow cases. And not all judges will consider a tenant's expenses or costs that they've incurred when determining a posting order. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Call, did you also want to respond to the Representative Tyson's uh, question? Yes. And in a rare instance, I'm going to agree almost everything with Ms. Kotorik just said, with the exception of the very last part. Uh, she's correct. Many jurisdictions don't have housing like uh, rental licenses. Many jurisdictions don't even have inspectors that a tenant can appeal to, to get an objective report on the condition of the property. When those do happen, however, those are instrumental and critical in resolving rent escrow cases and habitability defenses. They almost provide the guidebook for which the court is going to use to assess the scope and the depth of the issues that the tenant is raising regarding habitability. Uh, with regard to Ms. Kotorek's last concern, you know, may, maybe the amendment to this bill would be to outline more specifically that when tenants can demonstrate that they've incurred actual expenses in response to addressing habitability issues, that the court is required to allow those to be offset against any posting requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Tice. I actually like what um, Mr. College just said, because I think that makes sense. Um, in St. Cloud, obviously, we have inspections. In Wade Park, we do as well. And I hope that we can look at that and say, you know, how could you def how could you say that this was a house that was okay? Um, that, that makes me angry because nobody should have to live like this. But when we talk about mold and no uh, building code, I'm like, oh man, I fought mold as a remodeler for many, many years because some of the building codes that were put in place actually, I would say, um, make it a little bit easier for mold to, to rear its ugly head. Uh, and we saw that quite a while ago. And so um, when, when we talk about mold, my eyes are going to cross because I've worked so hard on the mold issue. And so has my husband that um, I, don't, I don't know that to say that there's no housing code. And maybe it's not within the rental area, but it certainly is uh, otherwise. So then again, that's all the more reason why you know, these areas really need to have inspectors and inspectors doing their job well. With that, I want to say thank you, Representative Abadje. I think that there's a little work we can maybe do on this. Uh, I really think our inspectors would help a lot of this. And, and I understand what you're saying about not all people require licenses and inspectors. I do think where we're talking about, they probably should have had inspectors. And so I hope we can look at that and not just, I don't like blanket legislation because there's a couple out of all the housing providers we have in Minnesota um, that we have to do that. So I would like it a little bit more pinpointed at what we can really do and what uh, won't, won't harm everybody. There's bad players everywhere, unfortunately. But thank you. Thank you. Representative Agbadje, final comments on your bill. Um, no, I just want to thank the committee for the robust discussion on this bill. Um, of course, always open to uh, more conversations about how we can make the bill better, um, especially as it moves forward. And I just ask for your support uh, on this bill. Thank you. And would you like to renew your motion? Yes, Madam Chair, I renew my motion that the uh, House File 3098 is re referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Civil Law. On judiciary finance and civil law. <laughs> judiciary finance and civil law. Sorry. The, the clerk will take the roll. Chair Houseman. Aye. Vice Chair Howard. Aye. Representative Tice. At this time, no. Representative Agbaje. Aye. Representative Bliss. No. Representative Gomez. Aye. Representative Hassan.
Asanai. Representative Heinrich. Heinrich, no. Representative Hart. Aye. Representative Jurgens. Jurgens, no. Representative Olson is excused. Representative Farr. Farr, no. And Representative Ryer. Ryer, aye. We have seven ayes and four nays, or five nays. There, there being seven ayes and five nays, the motion prevails and the bill is passed. Members, thank you for your attention. Where we are just we are managing to uh, adjourn uh, on time again, uh, so I thank you for your um, um, attention to, at this particular meeting. Members, our next meeting will be on Tuesday, March one. And there being no other business before the committee, we are adjourned.